Good evening. Welcome to our broadcast of Four Mile Baptist Church, our evening worship service. We are glad to have you with us. Thank you again for joining us. Let's go ahead and get started with a song. We'll stand and sing together as we start our worship service. Amen. So glad you could join us for our Sunday evening worship. So good to have you here in the house of the Lord. I know you're not here in person, but I'm glad you're on Facebook or YouTube and joining us for our Sunday evening online service. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the wonderful day we've had. And thank you, Lord, for this time that we have together to worship you. I want to thank you for each one who's tuned in and joining us in this worship service. I ask you now, Lord, you speak to our hearts. You know the hearts and lives and needs of every person. And Lord, you know how to speak to us. You know how to speak to our hearts and meet our needs. So we're asking you to do that tonight in our, in our lives. Lord, I thank you, Lord, for what you've done already today uh, in this house of worship. And Lord, I want to thank you for what you want to do tonight in our lives personally, Lord. You know every trouble, you know every trial, you know every circumstance, you know every need of every person on the sound of my voice. So I ask you, Lord, to meet those needs in accordance with your own perfect will. Speak to our hearts and meet our needs, and we'll thank you in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Amen. Well, I trust you've had a good day, and I want to thank the Lord for blessing us and being with us. And I want to thank you for joining us tonight. We're in for a good time in the house of the Lord tonight. Brother Ricky Duke is going to wind up his study on Israel, God's chosen people. And boy, we're in for a good time tonight. So let's just worship the Lord together, spirit and truth, and uh, learn some more from the Word of God. I'm telling you, this has been a great time and a great study as we've been looking into the Word of God. And I thank God for Brother Ricky. And he studies the Word of God. And boy, it's been a great, great truth right out of the book of Romans. I'm telling you, I'm excited about it. But before he brings the message tonight, we have the story behind the song. And I'm excited about that. I want to encourage you to come visit with us in person here at Four Mile Baptist Church. If you don't have a home church or 
Maybe uh, you haven't been to church in a while. I want to invite you to come be with us. We have Sunday school at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning right here in uh, in church. And uh, we have classes for all ages. I, ho- I hope you'll come visit with us. We have our Sunday morning live in-person service right here at Four Mile Baptist Church, right here in our auditorium. And I, I promise you we'll try our best to welcome you and just love you as old-fashioned country folks that love God. We just believe in going to meeting. And uh, I'm telling you, I want to invite you to come. We're located on the Wildlife Lake Road just off of Highway 100 South here in Somerville, Georgia. Come be with us. We'd love to have you and love for you to come and visit with us right here live and in person. On Wednesday night, we study the Word of God together 7 o'clock on Wednesday night. So I hope you'll come and be with us. Amen. And we're looking for a great time, great time in the Lord's house as we worship him together. Well, just before Brother Ricky Duke brings our message tonight, uh, we have a story behind the song. And boy, this is a good one tonight, I'm telling you. He was born John Willard Peterson in Lindbergh, uh, Lindbergh, uh, Kansas. He served in the Air Force and attended uh, Moody Bible Institutes. But as a teenager, John W. Peterson dreamed of being a singer and a soloist, and he was a good one. He often sung on the local radio station and in churches, and only in singing did he feel competent and confident. He wrote, uh, of course, those words. He said he had at least one place where he could excel, and he knew it, and he made the most of it with his strong voice, and he loved it. One summer... He got a job in a factory earning 50 cents uh, an hour at a machine making canvas for wheat binders. That machine was so noisy, so loud, that he sang at the top of his lungs hour after hour after hour making up melodies and imagining he was standing on stage and singing to the world. John didn't realize it until it was too late that he was ruining his voice. And he did. He ruined his voice. He wrote these words, I put such a terrific strain on my faltering voice, he wrote, uh, through overuse and inexperience that I damaged it beyond repair. When I fully realized what had happened that my voice would never again be beautiful I suffered an emotional shock that it took me months and months before I recovered Hmm. looking back now John writes I'm grateful if it had not happened I might have never developed as a writer a musical writer. John says, With my voice damaged, I turned more and more to writing, and that talent was allowed to emerge and develop in my life. When at first it seemed a tragedy, uh, what it what at first seemed as a tragedy was used for good, and the course of my life began to take shape. Today, John W. Peterson has been called the Dean of Modern Hymn Writers, and certainly he has. He has authored such such a great uh, repertoire of of music and hymns, uh, many of them being uh, So Send I You, It Took a Miracle, Such uh, Surely Goodness and Mercy, Jesus Led Me All the Way, No One Understands Like Jesus, I Believe in Miracles, And, of course, the song that we're going to sing tonight. He wrote over 100 songs and over 35 cantatas. Amazing, an amazing man, an amazing writer, an amazing uh, uh, compiler of music. And, of course, this one tonight that we're going to sing is one of his most popular composites. And, of course, he wrote it during the summer of 1961. He was ministering at uh, Montrose Bible Conference grounds in uh, Pennsylvania. And during one of those sessions, an opportunity was given for people to share a word of testimony. 
A man rose to his feet, unknown to him, unknown to John. The man's name simply known as Old Jim. He rose to his feet and he told how he had come to Jesus. He's telling his testimony. And when he said these words, it seemed like heaven came down and glory filled my soul. <laughs> right away, John, uh, John Peterson said, I sensed that it would be a fine title for a song. And John wrote it. So I wrote down, and later in the week, I completed the song, and it became a favorite almost immediately. Heaven came down, and glory filled my soul. When at the cross, the Savior made me whole. My sins were washed away. My night was turned to day. Heaven came down, and glory filled my soul. From a testimony <laughs> of an old man called Old Jim. What about that? Oh, John W. Peterson went home to be with the Lord September the 20th, 2016. He was inducted in Gospel Music's Hall of Fame in 1986. And today his music still loves on. You can still find it online. You can still find it everywhere published, but it's still active today. The music company of John W. Peterson Music dot com. You can look it up, and much of his music is still alive and well today, and it's alive tonight in our hearts as we sing this great, great song and worship the Lord together. Heaven came down, and glory filled my song. So let's worship the Lord together tonight in this song, and Brother Ricky Duke will come and bring our message. <laughs>
welcome you to Four Mile Baptist Church this evening service. And tonight we're going to be concluding our series of messages on God's chosen people, Israel. So if you got your Bibles handy, we'll be finishing up in Romans chapter 11. We'll be beginning in verse 25. But before we look into God's word, let's open in a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you for another opportunity to be here. God, we just pray, Heavenly Father. As we look into your word tonight, that God, that you'll just speak to hearts and you'll just open minds and that, that God, that we'll realize that you are not done with your people, that God, that Israel has been just set aside for a time being, God, where you're dealing with the Gentile nations. Father, then we just pray and thank you that the promises of your word have held true for, and will hold true, God, throughout all eternity. God, I just pray if there's any out there tonight that that God has an anti-Semitic heart, that God, that they, they've got an animosity toward the Jewish people for whatever reason. God, I just pray that as they listen to this message tonight, that God, that they'll get their eyes and ears open and that God, that they'll see that Israel is still your chosen people. In Jesus' name, amen. We saw last week in verses 1 through 24 of Romans chapter 11 that God is partial toward Israel. You know, God has always preserved a remnant of faithful Jews. And Romans chapter 11 refutes the idea that the church is spiritual Israel. That the Jews are no longer God's chosen people. In fact, just a couple of weeks ago in our local paper, uh, one of the ministers that's got an article in there, The way he put in his article, he said, Paul was talking here to the Jews, and in parentheses, he put out there, God's chosen people in Old Testament times. Referring to and insinuating that they are no longer God's people because we're living in the time of the Gentiles. We're living in the New Testament time, and therefore the church, and therefore we are God's chosen people. That's not what the Word of God teaches That's not what Romans 11. Romans 11 totally refutes that idea. Because the Jews rejected God, he has temporarily, and we saw that in Romans chapter 10, he's temporarily rejected them. And this rejection resulted, as we saw last week, in the way of salvation for the Gentile people, for the Gentile nations. And like I said last week, John John chapter 4 and verse 22, the last part of that verse says, For salvation is of the Jews, because it's through a Jewish girl, Mary, that Jesus Christ, God's own begotten Son, was born, the Messiah. He's a Jewish representative. He is a Jewish person because his lineage is all Jewish. So here, Gentiles, as we saw last week, are sustained and supported by the root. And we saw that the root is Israel. The root is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, and Israel means prince of God, and that's in Genesis chapter 32, verse 28. That God, God is the one that changed Jacob's name. Jacob didn't change it. God changed Jacob's name to Israel, meaning prince of God. And then we saw that Paul warned that if the Jews reject the goodness of God, and what is the goodness of God? The goodness of God is salvation. The goodness of God is strength. The goodness of God is sustenance from the root. And if we as Gentiles reject this goodness of God, then we also be rejected. Only our rejection will be permanent. So now as we get ready to look, we remember Romans chapter 9 talked about Israel was elected as God's chosen people. Israel, uh, chapter 10 of Romans, we saw Israel's rejection. Last week in verses 1 through 24, we saw that Israel's future restoration, and we're going to see tonight in verses 25 through 36, that Israel's restoration is final. It's permanent. So notice the first thing we see, 
the promise of Israel's restoration. We see that in verses 25 through 32. God is faithful to his word. Just as prophecy, Old Testament and all, has been fulfilled in the past, it, but Jesus Christ the Messiah was prophesied, everything that was prophesied came to pass, and just as that has been fulfilled, every other prophecy is going to be fulfilled. Things that has not been taking place yet will be fulfilled because, see, God is faithful to his word. The first thing we see this evening is the revelation of a mystery in verses 25 through 27. Notice verse 25. It says, For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of Gentiles be come. <clears throat> What's Paul doing? What's Paul saying? Paul is clearing up the misconception that they had in his time and the misconception that we have today about Israel. Their ignorance. When he says, you shouldn't be ignorant, what he's saying is this. He said, listen. He said, I am fixing to tell you something that is, is, is of extreme importance. What I'm fixing to tell you is extremely important. And he says, the mystery. Now, what's a mystery? A mystery is a divine truth that has been previously withheld, but now it's been revealed. So he said, here is a mystery. And this revelation, this mystery, is to show the Gentiles, number one, notice what it says right there, that lest ye should be wise in your own conceit, he's telling the Gentiles, we're not better than the Jews. Everybody's got this anti-Semitic attitude and all this stuff. You are not any better than they are. And don't think you are. Don't think because God has been blessing America for over 200 years that we got something that nobody else has. Because God can take it away just like that. We're no better. He said, your conceit. And notice this mystery is twofold here. It says, here at the last part, he says, that blindness in part. Now, we saw last week the word blindness right there is from a Greek word that means hardened or calloused. So their callousness is their hardening of their heart. And all. notice it says it's in part. It's not permanent. It's just partial. And the next thing, too, it says that, you know, it happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. When's that going to take place? What is the fullness of the Gentiles? God, in his infinite knowledge, knows when the last Gentile on this earth is going to put his faith and trust in him. And when that takes place, God's going to rapture out the church. He's going to take the church out of here. He's going to take all of the saved Gentiles and the saved Jews that, that are saved today, that remnant that's there today. He's going to rapture the church out. That fullness of the Gentiles is going to be done away with. Now, Jesus speaking in Luke chapter 21, verse 24, listen to what he says. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Now, what's the difference? The difference is the fullness of the Gentiles is when the Gentiles, when we're going to be taken out in the rapture. The time of the Gentiles is going to take place at the end of the tribulation period. At the battle of Armageddon, the fullness, the time of the Gentiles will be done away with. So what are you saying? Read, when you got time, we won't take time to look at it right now, but read Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 through 21. It's going to give you that picture. It's going to tell you that. Because you see, the tribulation period 
is the time that God has set aside, so to speak, in order to open the blinded eyes of Israel. Notice the rest of the verse. Notice what it says. Verse 26, it says, So all Israel shall be saved. Did you catch that? All Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away uh, ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. When's this going to take place? When, when is this going to happen? When will all Israel be saved? Because there's not been a time as of today all the way past that Israel, all Israel has been saved. So this has got to be future. This has got to be a future restoration time for the children of Israel. And this is referring, when it says all Israel, it's referring to the nation of Israel. This restoration is prophesied. Zechariah chapter 13. Look at verses 8 and 9. It says, And it shall come to pass, then all the land, saith the Lord, two parts therein shall be cut off and die, but the third shall be left therein. And I will bring the third part through the fire, and will refine them as silver is refined, and will try them as gold is tried, and they shall call on my name, and I will hear them, and I will say, It is my people, and they shall say, The Lord is my God. What's he saying here? This this time of refining is the tribulation period. That's what the tribulation period is for. Get the Jewish people to look for the Messiah. And here it says, uh, two-thirds of them won't do that. Two-thirds of them will still hang on to their traditions, to hang on to their religion, to hang on to everything man-made, so to speak. But a third of them there, it says that they're going to come through and that they're going to call on the name. During that tribulation period, during that time, a third of Israel is going to call on the name of the Messiah. They're going to accept Jesus Christ as their Messiah. And they're going to become my people and shall say, the Lord is my God. And notice then in chapter 14, in verse 9, it says, And the Lord shall be king over all the earth, in that day shall there be one Lord and the name one. You know, there's some out there that, that don't believe in the rapture. They don't believe in the tribulation period. They don't believe that there's going to be a thousand year reign. But that's what uh, Zechariah 14, 9 says. The Lord is going to be king over all the earth in that day. He's going to come. He's going to set down, step forth. Put his foot down as we see in, in Isaiah chapter 59. Listen to what he says in verse 21. It says, As for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord. My spirit that is upon thee and my words which I put in thy mouth shall not depart out of, out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed seed, saith the Lord. Notice, from henceforth and forever. Forever. So we see these promises to the Jewish people. We see this is an eternal promise. It's eternal. Forever lasting. Zechariah 14, look at verse 3. It says, Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of the battle... This is at the end of the tribulation period. It says, And these feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst, thereof toward the east and toward the west, and there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half of it to the south. That's when the Messiah comes and sets his foot down on earth. That's when the Messiah comes to set up his thousand-year millennial reign on this earth. 
And he said there, the third of the Jewish people will have accepted Messiah before he comes. That's the all Israel that's going to be saved. The tribulation period is just a time to prepare Israel for the second coming of the Messiah. For the time that Jesus Christ is going to set his foot. And notice what it says there in Romans chapter 11. It says, for this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. Remember as we saw in Romans chapter 9. Remember verse 4. It says, who are the Israelites who pertaineth to adoption? They've been elected of God. They've been chosen of God. And of the glory, the Shekinah glory filled the temple for the Jewish people. And the covenants, and remember we saw that all the covenants that God made with Israel were eternal. They're everlasting. So it can't be the church. These are for Israel and Israel only. And it says, and the giving of the law. The law was given to Israel in order to point them to the Messiah. And the service of God, he gave them the priests and the promises. Yes. All of the promises that he has made to Israel, he's going to keep. God doesn't go back on his word. So that's the revelation of the mystery. But notice the relation to God in verses 28 and 29. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake, for the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. What's he saying? The Jews are enemies concerning the gospel because they rejected Jesus Christ as the Messiah when he was here on earth. But because of that, you and I have the opportunity to be saved. Notice, concerning God's enemies for your sakes, but it's touching the election. They're still God's chosen people. They always have been, and they always will be. The church is not Israel. They're always been God's people. They are beloved for the Father's sakes. Notice that word fathers. Notice that little letter. So that's not talking about God the Father. And notice it's plural. Who's the fathers he's talking about? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The promises and the covenants that God made with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob will be fulfilled forever. They're eternal covenants. So the God's chosen people. His covenants. He made the covenants. He's not going to go back on his word. But in verses 30 and 32, and we're finishing up here. I'm gonna, the rest of the chapter, I'm not going to be as long on as what it, I've just been. But in verses 30 and 32, it says, For as ye in the times past have not believed God, and who's the ye there? Ye are the Gentile people. The ye are you and I. You have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief. Remember, we saw that, you know, last week. The way of salvation has been opened up for the Gentile people because the Jewish people rejected Jesus Christ as the Messiah when he first came. And yet we've obtained mercy. What is mercy? Mercy is God not giving us what we deserve. Because you and I deserve nothing more, nothing less, but to spend eternity in hell. Because we've turned our back on God ourselves. He said it right here. The unbelief. Even so have these also now not believed that through your mercy, they also might obtain mercy. That's why I say this is a responsibility of you and I as Gentiles. Our responsibility is to provoke Jewish people to jealousy. 
to provoke them to where they can see that, hey, the Gentiles are being blessed in ways that only God can be the ones blessing them, and that should be our blessings. So what is happening now? Why, why is the Gentiles being blessed? Because they've accepted the Messiah. They put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. So notice that it said, even though these also now not believed, that through your mercy through what the goodness God's given us, us, they may obtain mercy, the Jewish people may obtain mercy, for God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. And we've already seen that. There's no difference between the Jew and the Gentile. We're all sinners. Every one of us. It doesn't matter your lineage. It doesn't matter your religious affairs. Affiliation, only thing that matters is what you've done with Jesus Christ. So we have a responsibility. You know, God's promise of Israel's restoration. He's revealed this mystery to us here. He showed the relation to God. He showed us that we as Gentiles have a responsibility. And then lastly, we see the praise because of Israel's restoration. Verses 33 through 36. God is to be praised because God has never went back on his word. God never has. God never will. Everything in his word has or will come to pass. And because of that, we need to praise God. And what we're looking at here is talking about the restoration of Israel as a nation. And because God said he's going to do it, he deserves our praise. Why? Verses 33 through 35, we see that God is wise. Notice this. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor, or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again. God's wise. We can sum that up by putting it this way. His wisdom and his knowledge is beyond our comprehension. Okay? He don't need counselors to counsel him. He don't need anybody because he's infinite wisdom. But in that infinite wisdom, notice this, that God alone could devise a plan to punish sin. You know what happened? Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. What happened? Because God is a righteous and just God, he had no choice but to remove them out of that garden because of their sin. Now they're separated from him. Now they're lost forever. But God in his infinite wisdom took them out of the garden. In his infinite wisdom, he's going to let us go to hell. But yet, in his infinite wisdom... He devised a plan to punish us and still justly save the sinner. And that salvation is through Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. Death, burial, and resurrection. God sent his only son to die on the cross of Calvary in order to pay the sin debt, pay the sin penalty. Is he not worthy to be praised? Because he devised that pain. He, he could have said, Adam and Eve, it's over. I gave y'all the opportunity. You blew it. That's it. And if you had, all my, mankind would have been lost for all eternity. But no, he devised a plan. He come up with a plan and sent his only son. So verse 36 only God is worthy. For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. Only God's worthy. He's the reason for our existence. 
He's our sustainer. Knowing him intimately should be our ultimate goal because only God is worthy of our praise. Father God, we thank you for another opportunity to look into your word. God, I pray, Heavenly Father God, that if there's anyone out there tonight, God, that don't know you as their personal Savior, that, that God, that they'll put their faith and their trust in you because, God, only you are worthy to be praised. Only you, God, in your infinite wisdom, Father, came up and devised a plan that, that sinful man can still live for all eternity in your presence. God, thank you for that. Thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you for that, that he willingly came and died upon the cross of Calvary. And God, this evening, I pray for the Jewish nation of Israel. God, I pray, Heavenly Father, that, that God, that I know you've got a remnant saved out. You always have and you always will. And God, I just pray that that remnant, and God, I just pray that not only the remnant, but us as Jew, uh, Gentiles, God, that will provoke the nation of Israel to jealousy. God, that they'll see that we're being blessed by you because of our faith and trust in Jesus as the Messiah. God, thank you for your promises in your word. Thank you, God, that you'll never go back on those promises. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen.